Cupertino, California, 1991. Lisa Hopewell had settled into her boyfriend's condo while he was locked up in the county jail on drunk driving charges. The couple had a shared history of drug and alcohol abuse. Lisa camped out in his apartment and started selling his goods to raise money to buy drugs. When her boyfriend got word of what she was up to, he tried to put a stop to it. He had a couple of his employees go into his condominium where she had been living and basically try to evict her. Lisa was there, but she no longer needed to be evicted. When they got there, they found her body. She was dead. She had been bound and gagged with duct tape. When Santa Clara County Sheriff's deputies found Lisa Hopewell's body in her boyfriend's condo, it was the tragic end of what had begun as a charmed and privileged life. She had everything going for her. She was an accomplished tennis player. She went to Princeton University and was a graduate of that school. But to cope with the pressures of a high-stress job on Madison Avenue, she began drinking and using drugs. Eventually, she left New York. Lisa Hopewell moved out to the Bay Area where her father lived, became caught up in the drug culture, and gradually she went in this horrible downhill spiral. A spiral that ended in murder. Duct tape was wrapped around her nose and mouth, and her feet and hands were bound with tape as well. Investigators gathered the duct tape and some cigarette butts from the crime scene. As they began their investigation, they soon learned that Lisa's ex-boyfriend, an auto mechanic named Rick Walker, lived in the area. The couple had split up about three months earlier. In the case of Rick Walker, is you have a guy in the neighborhood who's an ex-boyfriend and there is a turbulent relationship, so that's reason to suspect him. A few days later, police brought Walker in for questioning. Me and Lisa had a relationship, you know, and it was up and down. Anything I said to try and help the case or try to help them was used against me. The police fingerprinted Rick, but couldn't connect him to the crime scene. Then, two weeks after Lisa's murder, investigators matched prints from the duct tape to a local drug dealer named Rasan Bowers. Deputies arrested Bowers and brought him in for questioning. Rashan Bowers was a drug dealer in East Palo Alto, and apparently he was the drug supplier for Lisa Hopewell. After hours of interrogation, Bowers confessed to being an accomplice to Lisa's murder. He eventually told police that Rick Walker had forced him at gunpoint to kill Lisa. They brought him in and questioned him, and went through several stories and they would tell him, you're gonna get the death sentence unless you tell us what we wanna hear. And that was, Rick Walker was good for the crime. Rick Walker insisted he was innocent. He only knew Bowers because he worked on his car. But he was arrested, assigned a state attorney, and in October of 1991, was tried for murder. They didn't have any evidence against me, nothing. No physical evidence, nothing. They couldn't place me at the scene of the crime. But prosecutors did have Bowers. The DA cut a last minute deal with him to testify against Rick in return for a reduced sentence. That kid got right on the witness stand. He cried. One of the jurors asked for tissue. And when she did, I was like, I'm done. On December 10th, 1991, the jury convicted Rick Walker of first-degree murder, which carried a maximum sentence of life in prison. His sentencing hearing was scheduled for January. I think I was getting ready to turn 12 or, in between 12 and 13. I knew he couldn't do something like that, but you have all these people saying he did something. Rick's parents also refused to believe their son was guilty. There was no evidence that connected him to it other than he knew the girl. That was all. While her son awaited sentencing, 
Rick's mother confided in a colleague on the school board about her son's conviction. As it turned out, this friend had a daughter studying law at Stanford. I was a third year law student and my mother called me up and said, Honey, my friend Myrtle's son has been convicted of murder and she's terribly upset and I told her my daughter's in law school and maybe she can help us. Allison Tucker, who wasn't studying criminal law, was at first reluctant to get involved. He had already been convicted by a jury, so I was at least skeptical about her concern that he'd been wrongly convicted. Despite her skepticism, Allison Tucker agreed to meet Rick's parents for lunch. Allison then went down to the county jail to meet Rick for the very first time. When I met Rick in the county jail, I was struck by what an eloquent witness in his own defense he was. He knew he was innocent. It's pretty uplifting just to have someone listen to your side of the story and to believe there's some validity to what he's saying. Coincidentally, not long after the meeting, some evidence surfaced that seemed to point to Rick's innocence. An inmate in the jail wrote a letter saying I was locked up and this guy confessed the crime to me. The guy was a friend of Rasan Bowers named Mark Swanson, recently arrested for drug possession. Mark Swanson was a young thug who was a friend of Rasan Bowers and he thought he was in for a simple burglary and he ended up being an accomplice to murder. In spite of her hectic law school schedule, Allison was intrigued by the compelling case and wanted to do whatever she could to help. She again met with the Walkers. I had the benefit of almost three years of legal education and at least two classes were in criminal law, so that wasn't much, but I was gonna do what I could. First, Allison instructed the Walkers to file for an appeal. Then she called Rick's defense attorney and gave him the new evidence on Mark Swanson. We decided to give that name to the defense attorney who gave it to the prosecutor to try to find out whether there was any way to link that man to the fingerprints that had been found at the scene and never matched. For the first time since his conviction, the Walker family allowed themselves to feel hopeful. But that hope would soon fade. In December of 1992, Rick Walker sat in the Santa Clara County Courthouse, awaiting sentencing for the first-degree murder of his ex-girlfriend, Lisa Hopewell. Rick's parents had recruited a family friend, third-year law student Allison Tucker, to help investigate their son's case. What she lacked in experience, however, she more than made up for in drive. That December, in between studying for her finals, Allison also studied Rick's trial transcripts. She came to a disturbing conclusion. The man who defended Rick Walker at trial didn't think investigating the case would help any. His efforts on Rick's behalf were just, frankly, pathetic. We had no money for high-powered lawyers. They assigned this lawyer. We found out that this man really could have cared less, you know, what happened to our son. But Allison did care. From information she found in the transcripts and other sources, she tracked down and interviewed three men who claimed that a man named Mark Swanson killed Lisa. All three were consistent, if not identical, about who had really killed Lisa Hopa, what had really happened on the night when she was murdered, and none of it involved Rick. Allison was now certain she knew who had killed Lisa Hopewell, and it wasn't Rick Walker. But Walker was due to be sentenced for the crime in just a few days. Allison persuaded the DA to postpone the sentencing and look into the new allegations. They did find Mark Swanson. They found him in custody on unrelated charges, and they said, we understand you may have been involved in the murder of Lisa Hopewell, and Mark Swanson said, I don't know Lisa Hopewell. And on the basis of that evidence, the DA went ahead and got Rick Walker sentenced to 26 to life. It was a devastating blow to Rick Walker's family. Well, we all cried night and day, you know. Grandma, how can they do this to my dad? And Rick had no choice but to resign himself to the probability of life in prison. I was bitter, 
angry. And I'm basic out of the DA when requires.